We are still in Mishnah number six of chapter six. And this is the 48 ways to wisdom. And we're up to way number nine, Bitahara. And Mishnah tells us that there are 48 different ways, paths through which we acquire wisdom. And way number nine is with purity, with tahara. Now, what exactly is purity? And why would purity lead us towards Torah, towards wisdom? Of course, purity is used in many different contexts in our literature and our philosophy. So, for example, we have an element of Jewish life called the mikvah which is a, what's called a ritual bathhouse or bathwater. And then you dunk stuff in there, it could be vessels, to be dunked in there, to be people that are dunked in there. And they emerge with purity. They enter with impurity. And somehow when they are enveloped, when they're immersed in this mikvah, there's some sort of transformation from impurity to purity. Purity is also used in the context of, of food, in the temple, only holy foods can be consumed. You have the truma, for example, which is the food eaten by the Kohen. They have to maintain the purity of that food, not allow it to become spiritually contaminated. In our prayers, we talk about the purity of our soul. Neshama shenasata bi tahorahi. Our neshama, our soul, is pure. The Talmud tells us, and this is how I began my book, I think it's chapter three, actually. It talks about how a child, before they're born, is given an oath and is told about what it has to accomplish in life. And they tell the child, be a tzaddik, and don't be a rasha. Be righteous and don't be wicked. And even if the whole world tells you that you're righteous in your eyes, view yourself as being wicked. And you should know that the Almighty is pure. His angels are pure. And the soul, the neshama that he places within you is pure. If you preserve and maintain its purity, fantastic. But if not, behold, I will take it from you. So again, the term purity is found in the context of people and things and foods. And here in the pristine state of the soul at birth. It's pure, but it can become impure. And that's where the soul is worn at a time to preserve, to maintain, to safeguard the purity of the soul. The Talmud of the Book of Brachos tells us, very iconic teaching in the Talmud, David wrote... In his Psalms, Barchi Nafshi Es Hashem. Let my soul bless Hashem. The Talmud tells us that really, we can't bless Hashem. What does the human body have in common with Hashem, with the Almighty? But the human soul, Barchi Nafshi, let my soul bless Hashem. Because only the soul is capable of blessing God. And the Talmud tells us that David wrote this word, or these words, five times. Baruch Nashi, let my soul bless the Almighty. And the reason why is because, that, is because there are five similarities between our soul and God. Just as the Almighty, his influence permeates the whole world, so to our soul, its influence permeates the whole body. Similarity number one. Just as the Almighty sees but is unseen, so to the soul sees but is unseen. Similarity number two. Just as the Almighty nourishes the whole world, so to the soul nourishes the whole body. Similarity number three. Just as the Almighty is pure, so to our soul is pure. And finally, just as the Almighty sits in the inner sanctums, whatever that means, so too our soul sits in the inner sanctums. And therefore, it's fitting the one, i.e. the soul, that has these five characteristics 
should come and sing the praises of the Almighty who has these five characteristics. So again, we see that one of the similarities between our soul and God is purity. So what exactly is purity? So the commentaries tell us that the term tahara, purity, symbolize a lack of contamination, a lack of admixture, a purity with no other elements. So for example, pure gold, featured in the Torah, talks about zahav, tahor, pure gold. When you have gold as a metal, you could add, add other stuff into it. You could add some copper, you could add some silver, you could add alloys. It's still gold, but it's not pure gold. Purity is defined as just the good thing with absolutely nothing else. 100% of the good thing. There's nothing else that is interwoven or mixed in. The soul is just holiness, at least at the beginning. When the soul is brought into this world, it's almost like the Almighty. There's nothing impure about it. There's no other foreign elements that are, that are there. But of course, the soul is told that now you're in a world where you can be affected by physicality, by sin, by corruption. And you, unlike God, you can be corrupted. You start off as pure, but will you end off as pure? That's in your hands. That's the challenge of life. Can we stave off the onslaughts of the Yitzhara? And can the soul be maintained in its pure state without any foreign influences over the course of its life. And shameless plug, that's what my book is about. But this is the idea of, of purity. It's just the good without anything of the bad mixed in. The Mesilas Yisharim, the way of the upright, tells us that really all mitzvot should be done with purity. What does it mean to do a mitzvah with purity? It means that everything that goes into the action of listening to the Almighty should not have any foreign influences. There should be no scintilla of bad in it. I could do a mitzvah and say, well... Now all my neighbors think I'm so righteous. Look at me. My friends will look up to me. I'll get respect and honor and distinction. Everyone will look up to me. Maybe they'll want to even give me gifts. You could do a mitzvah and have all those other foreign thoughts present. The objective of mitzvahs is to do it with purity with no adulteration, no additives, no preservatives, no foreign influences. And that's why the, the mikvah is symbolic of purity because it symbolizes total immersion. You enter a different world. It's a different world than the one that you have come from. As they just tell us that the Almighty serves as a mikvah for us. When a person totally submits themselves to the Almighty, you know, if you're in the mikvah, and a single strand of hair is outside the mikvah, the mikvah has not worked for you. It is contingent upon total immersion. And our objective is to have total immersion in purity, in the Almighty, so to speak. That's what purity means. And here we read in the Mishnah that it is one of the ways to acquire Torah with purity, without any contaminants. When you interact, you interface with Torah. That is you almost having a touch point with the Almighty. 
The Almighty himself sees but is unseen, but his Torah is his holiness concatenated and presented to us in ways that we can understand. So you have a touch point with God when you study Torah, but will it be pure? Will it be inoculated from any foreign elements? Will it be free of any other influences? So what does that mean? When you're studying, I always say that the best, the best bull sessions, or do they still say bull sessions? The best chats, the best schmoozes that you have in your life are with your study partner. You have a book of Talmud open before you, suddenly you could chat in the most verbose fashion. You never run out of things to talk about. You're never bored suddenly. You just could chat. Why? Because now you have an opportunity to interface with the Almighty. But you need to have a certain degree of focus. You have to have some deep work. No distractions. Focus just on that. That's the challenge. Not just the study, but to do it with purity. Complete focus. No other thoughts. Diligence. Every day. Ideally, really, every moment. We should study Torah, of course. You know, we have to understand what level we're at and not to try to jump and step any levels. But on the idealized fashion, it really should be all the time with continuity. The Talmud tells us that Rabbi Akiva spent 12 years just in the academy. And that was the deal that he had with his wife. After 12 years, he came back home. And he's about to walk into his house and he overhears his wife saying actually if my husband was here I would tell him to go back so he turns around and goes back and the commentaries all ask the question well maybe you could stay for the night maybe you could come in for you know for dinner but no she says another 12 years it's going to be 24 years not 12 plus a night and then another 12 no there's a certain degree of complete continuity of course this sounds to us like we're talking about aliens because we really are. This is Rabbi Kiva. <laughs> He's the one who is really the foundation of all of Mishnah and all of Talmud. It's all coming through him. So we're not comparing ourselves to Rabbi Kiva, but the concept of Torah study with total purity, with nothing else involved, that is, of course, the example that Rabbi Akiva presented for us. The joke that they say, or the mathematics that they say about this, is that 12 plus 12 does not equal 24. If you want to have 24 years of just Torah study, it's got to be 24 years, not 12, and then a day break, and then another 12. But again, of course, I'm not advising anyone to say that this is what they should do. This is not where we are holding. We're not ready to have that degree of commitment, of course. But the concept of total purity is exemplified in that story. What about studying Torah with the focus of getting some credentials? In the greatest yeshivos, they don't believe in this idea of you know four-year program until you have your rabbinic ordination. I'm studying Torah, so I get my degree, my rabbinic certification. True purity of Torah is, is Torah, and just that. Not to say, well, will also give me this degree, and your bachelor's of Talmudic law could be used for admission to law school, and I could get this and that. Total immersion, total dedication to the Word of God. You want to study the Almighty's Torah, not just Torah and wisdom and all that. Oh, it's, it's nice. There's, there's some stories here, and there are some lessons over here, and there's some good axioms and aphorisms here. You study the Almighty's Torah. You want to have that to the exclusion of anything else. The Rambam, in his Laws of Torah Study, which I think we've read in the past, but I want to read it again because it's so wonderful. He talks about this idea, but I'll, let's start from the beginning of the chapter because it's a good reminder of, of why we're so obsessed with Torah study. 
the Rambam talks about the three crowns that our nation is crowned with. There's the crown of priesthood, and that is exclusively the, the domain of Aaron and his descendants. If you're not a descendant of Aaron, if you're an ordinary Israelite, you are not qualified to have this crown. And then there's the crown of the monarchy, and that is the exclusive domain of David and David's descendants. If you're not part of that family, you have no access to this crown. And finally, there's the crown of Torah, and that is available for all who want to seize it. And this crown is greater than all the other crowns. And he gives us some examples. Suppose you have a high priest, the holiest spiritual leader of the people. But this high priest is an ignoramus. They're an Amaretz. And then you have a mamzer, you have a bastard. But the bastard is a Torah scholar. Which one of them is deserving of more praise? The Torah scholar, notwithstanding the fact that he's a bastard. Torah is more precious than pearls, says the Talmud, the word mipninim can also be read lifnai ulifnim. Torah is more precious than he who enters the inner sanctums of the temple. There is no mitzvah, the Rambam tells us, that is equal to Torah study. Torah study is the panacea, is the multivitamin is equal to all of the mitzvos put together. If you have any two mitzvos, one's Torah study and one's something else, you always favor the Torah study. Unless you're the only person who could do that other mitzvah, then you do the other mitzvah and you go back to study. When a person is judged before the Almighty, the first question orients around Torah study. And then he tells us, this is relevant to our point, if someone wants to fulfill this mitzvah properly and to be crowned, to be wreathed with the crown of Torah, he should not allow his mind to think about other things. And he shouldn't consider in his heart that he should acquire Torah together with wealth or with honor. If you want to acquire Torah properly, it's got to be done with purity. What does it mean, purity? This is what you want. This to the exclusion of everything else. Now, it's important to note, the Talmud tells us this, that there's a necessary evil Talmud tells us that a person should always do mitzvot and study Torah, even if they're trying to get other things. They have ulterior motives. Why? Because the only way to get to this level of Torah in its purity is only if you do Torah not. In its purity, if you start off with some ulterior motives. And therefore, it's a necessary evil for us to say, well, we'll, we'll do it for other reasons, but eventually we know the Talmud tells us that this will bring us to, towards doing it with pure motives. The ultimate goal is to do it with purity. Now I want to end off with an incredible idea. The Talmud tells us that if a person wants impurity, in heaven, they will allow that. If that's the path that you choose, that path will be availed to you. But if someone wants purity, they will be aided from above. And what does this mean? So you recall 
we talked about the five similarities between the soul and God. The soul fills up, permeates the whole body, just like God permeates the whole world. The soul sees but is unseen, just as God sees but is unseen. The soul sustains the whole body, just as God sustains the whole world. The soul is pure, just as God is pure. And the soul sits in the inner sanctum, so whatever that means, just as God sits in the inner sanctums, whatever that means. Now, the Goan of Villa tells us that these five characteristics of the soul correspond to the five different levels of the soul. The soul is comprised of five different levels, or really five different interconnected souls. The nefesh, the lowest level, that corresponds to the soul filling up, permeating the whole body. The ruach, which is the next level of the soul, that corresponds to the soul seeing but is unseen. The neshama corresponds to the soul sustaining the whole body. When we talk about the soul being pure, that corresponds to the level of the soul known as the chaya. And finally, the highest level, the yechida, corresponds to the soul sitting in the inner sanctums. When we talk about the soul being pure, it is rooted in the level of soul known as the chaya. Now, when we talk about the soul and the five parts of the soul, there are only three parts that are accessible to us. The other parts, the, other, the two higher parts, the chaya and the yechida, are inaccessible to us. So they're connected to our soul that we have within us. But in effect, they're actually inaccessible to us. Only Adam before his sin was able to embody the Chaya. We start off with the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of the level of our soul. And as we level up, we can access higher levels of our soul. We start with the nefesh of the nefesh, the lowest of the lowest part. And hopefully, if we advance in our spiritual quest, we can unlock higher and higher levels of our soul. But to the degree that we maintain the purity of the soul, after we die, after we pass, we're able to access those higher levels of our soul that were inaccessible to us in our current lifetime. And therefore, if a person is righteous, their identity will be that of their chaya in the world of the souls. When our sages tell us, if you want purity, if you come to seek purity, you will be aided from above what the commentaries tell us is that that level of, of soul that's so lofty, so advanced, so inaccessible to us, we only have access to it in the afterlife. If we seek it, if we seek purity, a little spark of that level of soul is showered upon us in our lives here and now. If you seek purity, if that's the path that you choose, you are going to be given superhuman powers. Superhuman, literally, because no humans can access that. And again, you won't have the full level of that soul, but you'll have a little sparklet of that highest level of soul, and that will supercharge you in your efforts in this world. So when we come to Torah study, and we're told that one way to really advance in our pursuit of wisdom is with purity. Now we know a little bit of the mechanics of how that works. We, of course, we're biased and we're selfish. And that's, of course, by design. We have the HR that says, you know, pursue this, pursue that. And what about your legacy in the world? Who's going to pay for everything? And what's going to be? And what's in it for you? We know that if we try to study with purity, 
we're going to unlock a level of spiritual energy that is otherworldly. That can be completely transformative in our pursuit of wisdom and our pursuit of the agenda of our soul. May we all be so fortunate. I thank you for listening. My address is Rabbi Wolby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions and your comments.